very progressive strength coach, has a lot of great stuff. Put your hands together for Clay, I appreciate it. I want to thank Coach Mack for the opportunity to come here and share whatever little bit of information I can share with you guys. I want to thank you for being in attendance. Also, want to thank a couple other people that have been influential in my career. One of them is here today. He's going to be speaking this weekend. Great cook. I just ran to him in the back room. As many of you know, he's the uh, inventor of the functional movement screen, of which I've used extensively in our training program. In addition to that, uh, Coach Johnny Parker. How many of you guys know who Coach Johnny Parker is? Coach Johnny Parker was my former boss in San Francisco. I was an assistant there under him. He's in the CSECA Hall of Fame. One of the legendary strength and conditioning coaches. And Bill Parcell's first strength coach. And he was a tremendous mentor to me. Just a couple other people. I don't want to bore you guys with all this, but many of you guys know Joe Ken, Charlie Francis, uh, Dan Paff. There are many people who had an opportunity to go out and visit. Every year, I try to pick four to five people to go in and have a one-to-one -one meeting with. You know, we have clinic talk right now, and you guys can see so much information to try to share with you guys in such a limited amount of time. But when you have the opportunity to go and meet with individuals and sit down and kind of pick their brain and, and, and see the whole progression and see the whole plan, it's something that is, is very rewarding and most of all something that I can take and incorporate into my program. Now, learning outcome. Here's what our goal is. Rather than just start hitting you guys with video of what we do, and I think that is certainly a great method, because right, there's a lot of people with visual. You guys have my presentation, so I need you to be visual and follow along with the handout. I want, when we finish this, I want you guys to have a good sense of how I go about constructing an off-season training program. Because it's, it's more than just, uh, here's what we're going to do on this given day. Right? Uh, we're going to look at stuff from the big picture, and then we're going to finish with some video where you guys can see some of the different things that we do. But what I want to provide to you today is a construct in terms of how we go about putting together our program from point A to point Z. First and foremost, we know that methods change from time to time, but principles are timeless. Right? Principles are timeless. And when we look at our profession, there are certain inherent principles that are going to be consistent regardless of what training program or your, your training methodology, whether if you're an effort-based program or, or whether you're an Olympic-based program, whatever it might be, there's just certain principles that are timeless. My thing is this. I've been coaching 23 years now, and I'm always trying to adapt to change. And I'm always trying to learn about new techniques and new methods and so forth that can help me and help me to help my student athletes. Nevertheless, when you look at what it comes to it boils down to is we must anchor to the things we believe in, yet to succeed, one needs to be able to adapt to change. We must always look to fine-tune and constantly refine our training practice. That's why you guys are here today. Right? You guys are here to constantly refine your training practices. That's what I try to do on a continual basis, on an annual basis, is just sit back, take a step back, and look at what, what we did this past year, how did it go? Was it effective? And we're, we're creating our own little informal research studies internally with our student athletes and with our programming and, and with how we go about coaching athletes. Now, this is my belief. I would believe that many of you guys probably share the same thing, but when I, when I sit down and program, there's certain things that are inherent in terms of my approach to helping athletes enhance their performance. First and foremost is this. At the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, I want my athletes to say that I inspired them to get more out of themselves than what they were willing to give on their own. That I pushed my players to become better. I pushed my athletes to strive for a level of excellence. That, that's why we're in this. That's why I'm in it. And I, I'd be remiss by not sharing this slide with you because you, you wouldn't, you'd leave this thing, you'd say, well, what's this guy Frank Carlisle about? Well, th this is what I'm about as it relates to coaching. I want them to say or realize that I coach the kids and not the weights. Bottom line, I want them to know that 
I coach the kids and not the way. We know when we gotta put the put a foot up in our kids behind, we know that. But we also gotta know when to take it out. Right? And at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, that kid's gotta know that we care about him more so than what? Then bench press at 500, let's squat 600 pounds. Get them to compete at the same level. Not that they won't attain the same level of success due to varying health, due, due to varying abilities, but getting them to compete builds trust and accountability. Our program is predicated on them competing. Once we lay out our structure, once we lay out our plan, we're going to compete. Right? Because that's what they do on game day. We're going to compete. And as you guys know, who have competitive-based programs, it brings the best out of the athlete. You want to talk about being able to just take a step back, right, and let them go, and know that they're going to give you everything that you need, and then some, have them compete. My only agenda is to help them improve. My thing is this. I don't want any credit, but I'll accept all the blame. If, if it's not working, it's on me. If our athletes are succeeding, I, I don't care about that, because I'm in it to help them succeed. My goal is always to have a tough, well-conditioned, and physically strong team. Next thing I do, establish standards of excellence. First and foremost, I tell our student athlete, it's not okay to be okay. Only a player's best is good enough from them and from us as coaches. My coaching staff, I've got a great coaching staff at Purdue University. I was fortunate enough to hire my entire staff and we all have different abilities. We all have different strengths, right? And I'm the orchestra leader. And I'm bringing everybody together so that I can, I can bring all those precious talents that my coaches have, and then I can disperse those talents throughout our program so that our athletes get every single thing that they need. The only time I have a problem with a player is when my expectations are higher than theirs. Bottom line is, my players know, here's, here's where it's at, and this is where you gotta go, right? If my, if my expectations, if I believe in you more than you believe in yourself, you've got an issue with it. Accomplishment, right? Our program is predicated on this. This is the foundation. Accomplishment builds confidence, which instills belief, and it has to go in that order. I'm not going to create a program for our, our athletes to fail. I've coached at every level. I've been a full-time strength and conditioning coach on the high school level. I've, been a, I've owned three private training centers where we worked with youth all the way up to a professional athlete. I've worked eight years at Philadelphia Eagles. I've worked six years at San Francisco 49ers. And I've worked, to my, I'm entering my second year as the director of sports performance at Purdue University. And bottom line is, athletes have to have a sense of accomplishment in what they're doing. Right? If they don't have accomplishment, with all the athletes that I coach, I can't say that one of them is going to reach their peak performance. <laughs> Six of the things that you believe are most important and don't yield to the things that don't. As a coach, over the years, I've come to realize I've, I've gone off on a tangent, I've tried this and I've tried that, but ultimately, I always come back to the things that I believe in, such as these things that I'm sharing with you right now that serve as the foundation of my program. Now, a couple, couple little principles here. When we look at training is specific to tasks, what does that mean? The more information you have about how fatigue is accumulated, the better strategy you can create regarding how to prepare your players to meet the physical demands of football. Think about it. We are always providing stimuli to our athletes through training, right? After stimuli typically is an adaptation depending on how these athletes recover. Right? And we're always looking at how they respond to training. Well, if, when you're building a program, if you're not looking at, if you're not looking at how fatigue is accumulated, then one, you can overtrain them. Right? Two, they may not make progress if you're not looking at those things. If you're just dropping the hammer, bam, bam, day after day after day after day, and they're doing the same type of high intensity loaded work, then ultimately they're not going to progress as you guys would want them to. So knowing how fatigue is accumulated is very, very important. Secondly, the highest specificity of training you can do is position-specific work utilizing the appropriate work for restoration. And we're going to go over that. Third, training just for aerobic power and aerobic capacity will not maximize a player's ability to be explosive and fast. 
Right? We want to train the pathways that are going to be specific to the sport of football. So when we do, if I had my athletes go out and do 400 meters, we're going to do six 400s. That's going to challenge them mentally. That's going to work a certain energy system, but that energy system is not specific to the game of football. It would be great for a quarter mile. So on that note, what does a football player's physical needs? What are their needs? In football, the ability to be explosive for five or seven seconds, typically a run, play is five seconds, pass play is about seven seconds, at 100% intensity, for as many plays as your for as many plays as your team is on the field. People say, well, what kind of shape you got to be in? You got to be in great enough shape to be able to respond and compete at the highest level for as many plays as your team is on the field. If that's a triple overtime, if that's a double overtime, whatever it might be, they have to be prepared to do such. Hence, we have a term that we coined APE, elastic power endurance. That's the ability, which is the ability to be explosive and powerful over and over and over again. That's what the guys, that's what the game demands. And that's what the players need, right? You've got to train that system to be explosive over and over and over again, right? Dominant, dominant energy system is the alactic energy system from a movement standpoint as well as what you do in the weight room. Now, the dominant strength quality, as we all know, is strength. Strength is, a, is the foundation of everything. So our program encompasses improving absolute strength or max strength, whatever term you want to use. Strength and power, as we know, power is force times velocity, very important component in the sport of football. Particularly, greater force development. It's the ability to generate high forces rapidly, right? When you look at greater force development, you're looking at the force time curve, right? And so we're looking at the ability to generate force as quick and as fast as possible. The offensive linemen and defensive linemen, they're engaged every single play, right? This is a necessity. Some of your outside guys, they may not necessarily be. But those inside guys, inside the box guys, this is very, very important. When we look at the dominant movement qualities to perform at the highest level, acceleration, right? Number one, most important, speed skill. We want to train absolute speed, and that's very, very important, right? You guys watched the combine this past weekend. Most of those guys didn't get to their absolute speed. 45, 50 yards when these guys get to their absolute speed, particularly if they're a trained athlete. Deceleration, the ability to stop, put the brakes on, the ability to re-accelerate, the ability to change direction with minimal loss of speed, balance, and control. Multi-directional speed, the ability to run explosively while under control in all different planes of motion. And then top end speed, which is certainly an important factor. Top end speed is important for several reasons, all right? Who of you guys know what speed reserve is? I have an athlete, okay, but I got a, I got a guy, we start training, he's running 4640. Right, we'll use this as an example. He's running 4640, okay? He's a wide receiver. Every play we're demanding that he want, run his route hard, let's just say it's a go route, for example. He's got to go, if we want him to run at 46 speed, he's got to run 100% to run at 46 speed. But now, let's say we've got this guy down at 452. 450, 40. He can run without having to use his 100. He's not maxed out when he runs that sprint now. He has what's called the speed reserve because this kid has improved his overall speed. He's improved his top end speed. So he doesn't have to run. He's running the same as he was when he's running 4 6, but he's using less energy, which is going to help him second, third, fourth quarter. So when we look at our training program, before I ever put a pen on paper, the number one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, when we ask the body performance a unit, there should be no weak links. That's the number one thing that we're trying to strive for, is no weak links, right? We want the body in balance. So our training program is going to stress balance. And not only is it going to stress balance in the weight room, it's going to stress balance in movement, right? Because a lot of coaches, when they program, they're, they're, they got a tunnel vision when they program, right? Some guys are just weight room oriented, right? Some guys are just movement oriented. You guys program, are both of those components important? 
You can't bring the weights to the field. You can bring that strength, you can bring that power, but the bottom line is it's a movement game, all right? And so you have to make sure that your program is in balance. I mentioned Gray Cook's name earlier. You guys will hear him speak tomorrow. I had the privilege of speaking with Gray Cook for Born Better back in the early 2000s when he introduced his functional movement to me. And it intrigued me then and it intrigued me even more. I've been using his functional movement to me and we use it as a risk management tool, it's an injury prevention tool. And basically, how many of you guys are familiar with functional movement screen? Great. A series of seven different tests, movement-oriented tests. Right? We test our guys. And let me tell you something what I see on the different levels when it comes to functional movement screen. Instead of working on the NFL level, we had guys coming in from college who were scoring lower than a 14 and had a lot of asymmetries, meaning they were not in balance. We had a lot of that. That's coming out of the college program, right? And let me tell you something. At that level, when those guys have imbalances, it leads to injury because it is a mega violent game at that level. Right? We want them to be able to, you know, I have a guy in the weight room and I have him squatting, okay? And the guy, the guy's getting his, you know, the, the guy can't get ankle, he has poor ankle mobility, poor hip mobility, right? And he's got excessive lumbar extension here. We, we gotta get the guy fixed up, right? He can't lift his head over his shoulders, right? So we have pressing movements of what snatch and the kick, the kick can't snatch. We're setting them up for failure. So we use these, we use this as a risk management tool. And this also helps to promote balance in our program. At Purdue University, we have incorporated functional movement screen with our physical therapy staff. And again, what, when we first started testing the athletes, they, we had a lot of asymmetries. When you have a score below 14, that's considered to be a poor score and puts you at risk for injury. For us, we take those scores and then we incorporate mobility exercises or corrective exercises to help correct those faulty movement patterns. And it shows up in the weight room. It shows up outside when we're going through our movement prep exercises. As we improve those, right, we start to bring the body back into balance and they're much more effective under a bar, and they're much more effective going through our agility, mobility, and change of direction type drills. Movement-based strength program trains the system as a whole and not in isolation. Do we do some isolation movements, right? We got college kids, those guys want to be gun gunned up on game day, so we will do some biceps and some tricep work. The kids, we, we want to get them jacked. We want them going out there feeling good. Overriding aspect of our program is about balance. So, here's some key program design considerations I'm going to cover real quick. And looking at your plan, right? Typically, we all have an eight week training program that we developed this summer. We have, we just finished an eight week program at Purdue for our winter conditioning, and, and we'll get ready for our summer conditioning program, which is approximately eight weeks. And the thing that, the thing that I always say is, when I look at my program and I look back, the question I ask myself is what was planned, what was actually complete, right? Because we all have ambitious goals when we put together our program. Right? But when you look back and you've recorded your, you've recorded your workouts and so forth, and you look back, is what is planned actually what is complete? Ask yourself that question, right? And I, I bet you 90% of the time you're going to say, no, no. When we plan, do we reserve the right make adjustments as we go? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm talking about your big goals. Ask yourself that question. So program. Synthesizing the art and science of coaching. All right? So coaching plus experience plus science. That's what we're looking at. Look at the science. Read the literature. Read the literature all the time. There's, it, it seems to me, and you guys may be able to attest to this, that, that the practitioner is always ahead of always ahead of the literature, right? As coaches, we're innovative, and we go out there, we do our thing. The bottom line is, we gotta wait for the research to catch up to kind of validate what we do. But we know, we're being in the field, that it works. So I use a combination of that. More importantly, I use my eye of the coach. My eye of the coach, you guys all know, you develop that field. You develop the field for where your team is. 
develop a feel for where your athletes are on a given day after a, after a high intensity type workout. And, and you adjust accordingly. You should always use your eye of the coach. Because bottom line is, I want to feel safe. And my thing is less is more. Now, do we get after it? Do we have our competitive games? Are we doing our combative stuff? Absolutely. We're doing all that stuff, right? But I, I build that into our plan. When I plan, I build that in. So then, if we have that type of work and I know that it's a, it's a super high physical output, then that next day, I'm probably going to have some type of low intensity plus type of work to offset that type of work, right? So, this is kind of what I talk about. Theory should lead to practice, but reality practice leads to theory. Proven methods to yield the results you're looking for. One big thing is key for me is the harmony of thought in off-season preparation. When you look at the plan, it's got to be unified. Everything about what you do, it has to be unified, right? What has to be unified? Recovery. I will start with recovery first. Recovery's got to be unified and credit into your overall plan. Your movement, your weights, your nutrition, right? Mental skills and mental preparation. All those things are important and need to be accounted for in your overall plan. During the course of a, an eight-week plan, we have a mental skills component to what we do. Very big. We'll have a, a psychologist come in, a sports psychologist, and he talks to the athletes about focus and mental preparation and all that. And it coincides with where we are in each stage. Week one, here's what the emphasis is. Week two, week three, week four, as we build to week eight. Another important thing for us is quantifying loads. It's important to know how much your athletes are actually improving. You gotta quantify your loads. Workout cards, however, however you do it, everyone's got their own way of quantifying loads, but that's, that's very, very important. You wanna be able to look at the density of your workloads. And you want to be able to look at it per training block. Whether you're using a three-week training block, a four-week training block, whatever it might be, whatever, whatever system you're using, you want to be able to quantify that. All right. Other program design considerations. We've got to stop chasing numbers in the weight room and teach and provide a foundation for our athletes to build on. Now, let me preface this by saying this. We all want to improve numbers for our student athletes. As a head coach, as a head strength and conditioning coach, my coach is always asking me, how much is he bench? How much is he squat? How much is he deadlift? How much is he clean? Right? And I've got a great buy-in with our head coach. I simply share with the head coach, there are some foundational things that we have to get cleared up. Whether it be some of the corrective stuff, that we gotta get cleared up, that doesn't mean that we don't lift, because we do it concurrently. Nevertheless, I've got a buy-in from my head coach that, hey, Dwayne, you tell me when these guys are ready to crank. It works great. It works great for us. Internal load over external load, all right? So my younger athletes that come in as freshmen, they could have come from the best strength and conditioning program, high school strength and conditioning program. But bottom line is, I'm going to find out where these guys are at. I'm going to find out if these guys can pull up, chin up. I'm going to find out you know, if they do various body weight exercises. I, just want, I, I need to know that stuff. I'm going to find out what kind of pillar strength these guys have before I place a heavy external load on their back. And the kid's got poor technique, very poor, very poor strength and poor control and poor stability. I need, to, I need to know these things before I just come in and I say, all right, here's what we're working on for this intensity, and we're doing this 5 3 one program and so forth. These are things that are very important. Train for speed and train for speed. Okay, we train for speed year round. You gotta train fast to beat that. Alright? We'll feed we'll feed those fast switch. Alright? We'll train for speed. We do it smart. And it's not just okay, we're gonna put parachutes on, we're gonna put this on and so forth. Right? It may be something simple when we start the off-season program, it might be something as simple as doing a neural sprint, which is a three to four step sprint. Right? Three to four step sprint, but we're working on mechanics, we're working on acceleration, we're working on different components. It's going to help them get faster, and we build from there. At some point, you must identify a player's limiting factor. Now, I know we all work with group, big groups of athletes, and we may not have the resources, coaching resources, to put our eyeballs on every single athlete. But one thing that's very important is that at some point, you've got to be able to identify a player's limiting factor. Right? 
on the NFL level, that's one of the things that you really seek, is to, those guys, it's such a small margin of, of talent. It's not like high school where, you know, running back, you just run all over anybody. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? The kids are that much talent. And then college is a little different. You're playing at this level, the Big Ten, SEC level, the, the margin narrows. You've got to make sure that you're helping these athletes because bottom line is, their limiting factor is always going to show up on the field. When you look at testing, it's game day. It's game day. Right? You want to know how your athletes are performing and what their needs are, just look at, just look at the film and look at game day, and it'll, it'll show you real quick in terms of what their needs are. Right? So whether it be speed, mobility, strength, change of direction skills, and so forth. When you think of mobility, the offensive line, Coaches will be the first one to say, hey, how, how can you get this kid to get out of the stance? He's a waist bender. I need him to be a knee bender. I need him to be able to bend from his ankles. Lots of mobility issues, right? If a guy can't bend, then he can't play with leverage, and thus his power is minimized, right? So we got to make sure that we address those things by giving the kids appropriate exercises and protocols that's going to help them be able to have greater mobility. So when we talk mobility, do you know most you Young athletes have limited mobility in their ankles, their hips, and their and T spines. Train both ISO and bilateral movement. We don't just train squat, all right? That's a bilateral movement. Because what I found was just if I only just train squat, right? And a guy has an asymmetry, then that dominant side is going to rule the day. So I gotta train the single leg movement. Oftentimes, when you have single leg movements, whether it be a single leg squat, a Bulgarian squat, a lunge, whatever it might be, it's going to just, when you're coaching on, it's going to tell you more about an athlete's mobility and strength, power, than a squat itself. All right? You, you can't really mask that much on a single leg exercise. So we train both ISO and bilateral movement. If at all possible, have your athletes get a foot screen. This is just a recommendation I get. Just we've seen a lot of athletes have to get a foot screen from a podiatrist to see you know, if, is that person a, an excessive overpronate. Typically, African American athletes they tend to pronate, right? And so you'll see them when they squat, they go valgus real quick, right? Have them check that out. And then we classify our exercises when we build our program, our strength exercises, our movement exercises. Again, that's another tool to balance the body. Here's some of the things that's a must. Certain foundational movements we have to master before we progress. Like the deadlift exercise. The pure strength movement builds hip and lower body. Strength also teaches force application. That's one big thing that's important, is teaching these young men how to apply force through the ground. Because it relates and supports everything that we do. Acceleration, deceleration is position. We've got to teach them that for optimal movement. Right? We've got to teach them how to accelerate properly. You'll see kids that get in acceleration position, all right, and they're at this angle here. We're going to teach a kid how to accelerate properly. Front squat, overhead press, no shoulder strength, chin up, relative body weight exercise, jumping and landing, right? Teaching an athlete how to work out of an athletic position, how to start in an athletic position, how to land in an athletic position. All of our Olympic lifts, they support those things. Everything that we do, you start in an athletic position for the most part. And then, Finally, core stability and pelvic control. Now, here's just a little principle, all right? When you look at, I call it my gas tank theory. You're talking about synthesizing weight and training and movement training, all right? There's a cost to everything. There's a cost to everything. So if you're doing a combo session, weight training, movement training, And it's, it's, you're doing a speed session combined with a max, a heavy lift, all right? We're working 85% or higher. We're working 90%, somewhere in that range, combined with a speed session. Well, if you look at the demands on the CNS, we're starting with a full, a full tank of gas here, right? So you look at, we start with our movement session first, right? We start with the movement session first. Well, by the time they finish the movement session and they get into the weight room, I'm just, this is approximation. We're at half, we're at half the tank of strength. I got about half the tank of, of reserve to be able to get after in the weight room. 
I share this point with you because one thing that has worked for me when I'm planning, I, I simply, you know, we have the seed, the, the RPE skill. Well, I have, I have my own modified RPE skill right, where I classify my various training activities. So I have a high intensity activity. I have a medium high training activity. High training activity. Intensity. Medium high intensity. I have a low intensity or medium low intensity. So when I'm putting together my combo sessions, my weight training, my movement, I'm not going to necessarily do a heavy lift followed by a heavy movement on that given day as it relates to training and planning. Because I got to figure out well, where's my money. And, and the most important thing I'm going to do with the, at the beginning of the week, if I'm going to train speed, I'm going to train that sucker at the beginning of the week if I want it to get fat. Because the team is cumulative, and as you go over the course of a week, they ain't going to be able to give you the same that they were able to give you at the beginning of the week. So when I look at my program, right, I first start with that intensity scale, and then I'm balancing things. And I'll show you an example of that a little later. So this is after the movement session. This is what I'm dealing with with the strength training. Now again, I preface this by saying, we know we got to get it out of it. Right? They come into the weight room, us as strength and conditioning coaches, we're not thinking along these lines. When they come in, we got to get it out of it, period. Bottom line. Nevertheless, from a planning standpoint, right, I'm going to plan this stuff beforehand. So, what you have to look at for a given session is it going to be opponents? Are they going to be opponents of one another? Or are they going to be teammates? Teammates is putting together that intensity scale and pairing up your intensity scale with your strength and movement accordingly over, over a given week so that they're opponents as opposed to team, teammates. Because at the end of, at the, end of the day, if they, if they, have, if they suffer from PNF fatigue, whether it be neural fatigue, right, or whether it be peripheral fatigue, then they're not going to give you the same performance. And, and ultimately, it's going to go like this. I'm about performance. I'm about our athletes get better and making progress as we go forward. So, real magic. When you understand how to manipulate various loading parameters as it relates to weight and movement, you guys know all this exercises, set range, prep range, tempo. You know, if you're going to use a prolific chart, what, what, you're going to use conjugate systems, you're going to use west side, whatever it might be, your loads, your recovery between sets. Recovery between sets is a big thing, it's a huge thing. When we work at a very high tempo, I have a limited amount of time. Our guys have a class schedule. They got to get to class, right? So I've got, I've got about 90 minutes to get it done. So we have a very dense training program. And now, when we got to get after it on our strength exercises, they get more recovery. As you guys know they, they, they don't get more recovery. They're not going to be able to lift as much weight. It's real simple. So they get more recovery. When we get to our auxiliary stuff, we're working. We're working at a great, great tempo. When we get to volume, to speed, intensity, recovery between strength and movement. All right, now, this may be a little hard to see, but now we're getting to the part where we're going to kind of construct, construct the program. So what I do, I sit down and I put together my movement training worksheet. All right? And so what this is, I break down at the top of the different categories of various movement activities. So I assign a different movement activity to a category. So you've got position technique, right? So position work. You've got multi-directional movement. So you've got programmable multi-directional movement, right? That's where an athlete knows where he's going. So if I put the cone here, to there, the athlete, I say sprint to here, boom, touch, and then shuffle to here, they know where they're going. All right? Then you've got random or reactive work. Random reactive work is just that. It's reactive. If I have them doing, you know, they're facing this way, we're doing a jumping jack, and then I say sprint, boom, now they're going to turn and sprint toward me. If we're doing gain speed, right? That gain speed work, as we get closer to the season, and what I love, what I love about college, different than the NFL. College works like this. You can take your athletes, our, our off-season program starts the first week of June, 
and it goes all the way up until the last week of July. They get a week off, and then bang, you hit it. You're involved. NFL, they finish the third week of June. Training camp doesn't start until the end of July, and they have five weeks off. So you had them for 14 weeks. Right now, I think the NFL possibly throwing that down to 10 weeks. You had them for 14 weeks, right? You made progress, and then they're off for five weeks. That's terrible. That's terrible. You guys come back, you don't know what kind of shape they're in, right? They do the conditioning test, and you're held accountable, and you're just sitting there, and you're like, oh, please let like this guy pass the conditioning test, right? But I like college for that reason, okay? Sand foot work. You got a sand pit. We'll do our change of direction work in the sand pit. Hill. I'll put hills in this category because we will do some change of direction work up on the hill. Okay. Then you got your world of college stuff. So we're going to do cardio. That falls in that category. We got our tempo runs. Falls in that category. Our work capacity circuits. Falls in that category. Boxing or, or MMA, MMA type stuff. Food work. Sled pushing could fall in that. Hills, again, sand pit, it depends. You'll see hills, or you'll see certain exercises or activities in multiple categories. Okay? So then, you got your APE work. That's our money stuff. Elastic positional endurance. We went over that. That's the five to seven second type of work. 95 to 100 percent intensity. So then, you got your team conditioning. Team conditioning could be, like, you know, the beginning of the offseason, we're going to do relay racing, right? So we're going, we're going 60 yards. But we'll say we start with 40 yards. There's a guy down there, I'm here, he's got to run, hands off, this guy hands off, it's 40 yards. It's any activity that's within that 40, 46 second, 47 second range. And that would be that that would be non-specific activity, something that we would do early in the offseason. Then you got your metabolic work. Okay? That's a non-specific football related work. Football games can fall into that, depending on how you structure your games. Sled pushing, right? That can fall in that. Or a six-second sled push. I'm not talking about sled pushing 400 yards, right? We'll, we'll do stuff like that for punishment. But in terms of training, it's going to be effective. Depends what your goal is. If I want to build some mental toughness, I want to wax a guy, right, we're going to do that work. I'm not going to put it in my APE. I'm going to put that work, right? I'm going to put that work in, in uh, my aerobic power work. Well, then you got your stand pick, hill work, position specific stuff. And then you got your speed. So when we work speed, I'm not just working, you know, just straight linear type speed. We're going to work mechanics. We're always going to work mechanics because I want the right forward patterns in place. All right, so I want that. We're going to work, you know, piles. That's a speed component. We're going to do start and acceleration work, top end work, system work, system work, hill work, you know, red ball work, contrast work, heavy sled push. And then they come off the sled push into an acceleration, 10, 15 yard acceleration. Love that kind of work. So that's kind of how I set up the movement training scheme. Bottom line is, no matter what drill that we're doing, when it comes to our speed stuff, we want to minimize ground contact time. Apply the force in the right direction, right, and minimize the amount of time that we're spending on the ground. On the ground. Bottom line, you gotta coach that when you're active, right? You gotta coach that. If you look at this position right here, this is a uh, this is a linebacker. Look at that foot. He's dorsiflex. Look at the parallel shin, shin angle. Right? That, that's a nice looking acceleration position. I'm not pat myself on the back. He did that. Okay. So if you look at a sample training template, you've got and there, there, there are many of them, but I just this is just an example to show you guys how an off-season weekly template. If you look on the right, that's your intensity scale. High is in red, medium high, low, then medium is in green, medium low is in blue, and then low. And so if you look at how it synthesizes, you got a high intensity weight day, right? High intensity movement day, then this is a four day split, by the way. So you're going upper in the weight room, upper, lower, upper, lower. If you look at this, you've got the upper day, that kind of complement, there's not a lot of peripheral fatigue because we're working the upper extremity after having done a speed day. You guys follow me on that? And so it's just a matter of how you blend those components together. High school football in-season template. This will be in your handout. High school sports in-season template. Okay. Now, we've, we've gone through all this, all this planning, right? We've gone through all this planning. Let's say if I have an eight-week program, we're just going to use one block to anything. I lay 
tell them what one goal. Right? What a block means four weeks. So what are my goals for that four week program? Obviously it's going to depend on that time. And this is this this is not necessarily specific to right now. But we're going to do lean body mass. Right? We're going to do that via supersets, work to rest ratios. When we want structural balance, right? let's do our corrective exercises. We want to identify and balance the postural issues. Right? Single limb exercises, stabilization, and so forth. We want to prepare muscles, tendons, and joints to endure subsequent training blocks as we move into strength and power. Okay? We want to prepare energy systems and proper movement patterns to endure, endure subsequent training block, uh, blocks. We want to establish team unity and collective work ethic. Now, that's huge. That is absolutely huge. We got it. That's a that's a major goal. And for coming into the program last year, that was that was a major goal of ours. Anytime there's a change, you have students. They're wondering. They, their heads get all screwed up and so forth. And, and uh, we can get divisions in terms of unity and where guys are at. And so for us, that was a big thing. Get these guys working together and they collect the work ethic. Work ethic, and that's something that we're going to continue to strive to do every day. Because in college, you guys know, head coach puts a lot of trust in us to establish discipline, to establish that team unity <coughs> building. There's a lot of things that we do with that. We want to implement a comprehensive recovery and regen program. Right? Our guys, our guys are foam rolling. They come into the workout, they foam roll. Right? They foam roll. Right? We do active isolated stretching with the ropes. We do, we have an extensive program with cold tubs. We do contract that. We, our nutrition is huge. It's absolutely a huge component for what we do. And we try to set that in place for the student athletes, particularly pre and post workout nutrition in during the program. Very important for our student athletes. And then try to educate the athletes on proper eating patterns just throughout, throughout their life. And we want to establish our training rules for that first block. Okay, now, so when we look at this block, right, you've got, down here you've got weekly cycle. You've got Monday. M stands for movement, W stands for weights. If you look at this G, you see SP slash AP. SP slash AP, that's speed and elastic power. UB hyphen PF for weights. Go to the G, that's upper body primary foundation. So when you look at this G, and you, you, you go up to this block here, you've got APE. So in block one, APE work. Remember, we're working, we're going to work general to specific as it relates to the dominant energy system. So APE work, that's going to come in, in a subsequent block. So right now, as you can see, MD, multi-directional movement. Right here, we've got one unit of that. On Wednesday, we have AP, aerobic power. We've got two units of that. Here's aerobic power. We do aerobic power on Thursday. We do aerobic power on Tuesday. And then going back to that other chart I showed you, it had the different aerobic power activities. So now when I'm planning, one aerobic power workout might be a work capacity circuit. Where we're, on, we're on the field and we're doing we're doing med ball tosses into a sprint and so forth. So that's that's just a model to show you guys how we plan. What's really key is the, the quality of session. I can look at a, over a week and movement wise, I know I got two units of, of aerobic power work. I know I got one unit of speed work in. I know I got another unit of both directional. And that changes with each block as we progress to get closer to our closer to camp. So we actually, our last two weeks, we had we did four units of alactic positional work, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, as we went into camp, because they're going to be playing football every single day. Now, I'm just going to show you kind of a little format of, of some of the things that we do. You've got an weight room session. We'll do corrective exercises or movement prep. They're the same to me. We'll do explosive exercises. We've got our strength exercises, and then we always do a team finisher to build that unit. So just some movement prep stuff. Try to 
keep the legs straight, drive the heels down to the ground. Okay. Doing some rapid response, opening the hips up, doing a lunge. Doing the rotation, trying to keep the back leg straight. We'll drive it through the heel, go up. And again, you see guys do this, right? You know they lack mobility when they try to raise this leg up and this hip flex is really tight. And you see a, a bent angle in that hip flex. Those are some examples of some movement prep stuff. Here's what we do pre-lift. Right? And this is based on our functional movement screen results. So because we have so many guys, we have a global corrective exercise program that's created by us as coaches along with our physical therapy staff. Reach, roll, and lift. The variation of great cook squat. You guys have all seen this type of stuff. So these are just we snatch, we clean. Accommodating resistance. So there's a place for everything. Again, it's all on how you plan. Here's an example of the team finisher. I think I got what a minute to coach. Okay. Here's the team finisher at the end of the workout. We want to squat to a row, go to some abs, more stuff, and just bringing the guys together at the end of the workout. stabilization exercise here while moving the extremity. Alright. I want to uh, I have a uh, table to break 10 of my DVDs here. I've got a DVD set titled Total Football Training. I only sell them directly at clinics because a marketing company sells them. Typically, uh, I'm selling at this clinic for $100. On the website, I think it's footballtrain.com, they sell it for $297. You guys are more than welcome to take a look at it. It's a six DVD set, eight week training program, along with a 137 page manual. It's, it's a step by step. It shows, it shows movement, it shows strength, nutrition piece, recovery piece, the whole shebang. I want to take the time now to answer. We've got about a couple minutes. If you guys have any questions or anything, please uh, proceed. So. The question is, have I run into any complications in implementing my program from college, from the pro level to the college level? I've, had, I've adapted my program to a certain degree. Professional level is entirely different than the college level. And I've run into, I've run into no complications. I've had great support from my head coach. My student athletes have bought in. And we've, uh, we're making progress. The question is, why do I run 60-yard sprints in the offseason? I gave that as an example of, of a, uh, a work capacity, a non-specific football thing that we can do. It's, improved, it's to improve 
speed and endurance. Let's move speed and endurance. So we'll do that in a team, in a team setting. It works great. Relay races, our guys love that. They get an opportunity to compete. Again, those are programs predicated on competing. 60 yard distance, zero to six, zero to seven seconds roughly. And it's, uh, I, I found this to be a real good, real good training distance. Thank you very much. It's great to introduce you. Oh, by the way, I'll be over to you guys.